Have Maria Prayersima. Let the peace of Christ rejoice in your hearts. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now we've talked on this topic before, but it's so important. It certainly bears repeating. We all want to be happy. We all want to be loved. And we all want to be free. All those desires are written in the very hearts of men. They're our deepest, most profound desires. But you don't need me to tell you that something is really wrong here. Really wrong. It's obvious for me, even the most casual glance at our society today, instead of happiness, instead of peace, instead of a well-being, there's so much existential misery and unhappiness and anger and desperation. Instead of love, they have loneliness, abandonment, and emptiness. Instead of freedom, people are in bondage to vices and sin. They're unhappy. They got distress and turmoil over the social chaos. In all the pain and emptiness that you can see in so many people's lives, the agitation, the bustling about, broken marriages, shattered families, perversions, the hypersexualization of our society, all these kind of things that you see. People covered with tattoos and piercings, empty seminaries, empty cloisters, empty pews. Those are all visible signs. There's a sort of emptiness inside so many people, an unhappiness of sort of this living wreckage of so many lives that are meant for love and peace and happiness. And every one of these people wants to be loved. But for the most part, they're not experiencing that, and they actually don't even know how to experience that. So, why all this chaos and sin? It's because people actually are looking for love, but they don't know where to find it, so they're looking, they're trying to fill this emptiness inside, they're grasping at different pleasures, they're trying to deaden the pain with drugs or alcohol, or just turning up the music ever louder, and so forth. But everybody wants to be loved, everybody needs to be loved, everybody was created to be loved. No. I don't want to show hands, but let's bring it a little closer. How many of you are really truly happy and have a deep inner peace and manage to keep your peace no matter how troubling the fears are in the church, or in the state, or even in your own home? How many of you really feel the love of God and truly feel that? Because we all want to be happy. We're made to have that kind of peace. Those desires are written in our hearts. There are deepest, most profound aspirations, yet in my pastoral experience, there are very few people that can say they're truly happy, that they really feel free and loved. Why is that so rare? We'll talk about that today. I'm going to talk about why so few people have that experience. And more importantly, though, than why, I'm going to talk about what each of us can do about that what each of us can do to start actually experiencing that true happiness, that true love, that deep and lasting inner peace and freedom. Now in his book, Interior Freedom, uh, Father Jacques Philippe, and I, he's a man I consider probably to be the most profound spiritual writer uh, today, living today, he writes, quote, every Christian needs to discover that even the most unfavorable circumstances we possess within ourselves a space of freedom that nobody can take away because God is its source and guarantee. Without this discovery, we will always be restricted in some way. We will never taste true happiness. But if we have learned to let this inner space of freedom unfold, then even though many things may well cause us to suffer, nothing will be able to really oppress us or crush us. If we have learned to let this inner space of freedom unfold, that even though many things may cause us to suffer, nothing will ever be able to crush us or oppress us. St. Maximilian Kolbe was at peace when he was in Auschwitz. That's worth meditating on. If he could find his peace in Auschwitz, then we can find our peace here. Let's talk about that. Because the sad fact of the matter is very few, very few people have found that inner space of freedom 
nowadays, and that's why so few can say they're truly at peace, they're truly loved, they truly feel free. In other words, what we're saying is if someone doesn't know how to do that, they aren't feeling love, but to the degree they know how to, to experience this, to unfold this energy of freedom, then they'll be happy. And this isn't some sort of weird Eastern meditation technique where we deny reality. It's looking reality really in the face. St. Maximilian wasn't denying, he was in Auschwitz. Okay, why is it so folded up in most people? In one word, it's woundedness. The reason why so many people are folded up is because of their woundedness. So in the time we have left, we're going to sketch out in broad terms just how each one of us can approach the problem of our woundedness. And as I said, we've talked about some of these aspects before, but I come at it in different areas. So if you listen to all the things over time, you can put it together and really have a program going for yourself. We'll briefly review what we mean by wounds. There's two basic kinds of wounds, physical and spiritual. When you cut yourself with a knife, it makes a physical wound. The severity of the wound depends on how deep you cut yourself, where you were cut, you know. Over time, as the wound heals, typically the pain decreases till all you have left is a scar. Now a spiritual wound is exactly analogous to a physical wound. A spiritual wound is a result of a trauma or an event in someone's life that left an impression that sometimes can be remembered and sometimes not. The seriousness of the wound, the depth of that spiritual wound, so to speak, depends on the seriousness of the trauma or the event. The traumas that cause such wounds can range from uh, self-inflicted wounds resulting from every sin, because each and every sin does wound us, or to wounds that have been inflicted on us uh, through no fault of our own, like being violently assaulted, or even be, being conceived outside of marriage, because that actually will wound somebody. But unlike the typical progression of a physical wound, from damage to healing to scar, Typically, a spiritual wound remains present. And why is that? It's because in spite of the fact that they cause pain, people typically don't know how to heal from spiritual wounds. But because a wound is a source of pain, we typically build bar barriers around it. Just like you, if you had a bad cut on your arm, you'd be really favorable. You wouldn't want to lean your arm on something. You're careful not to bump it into something. With a spiritual wound, people develop behavioral patterns to protect themselves so they can live with it and get on with life. These barriers are typically uh, expressed in certain personality quirks and faults. They, they serve to protect, protect us from that pain. We might see them expressed as anger, uh, resentment, hatred of certain people or situations, not being able to deal with large crowds of people, living in the past, living in the future, and so forth. It's a really brief summary. I've talked in more depth elsewhere. On his website, Father Chad Ripiger has four excellent 45-minute long spiritual conferences dealing with wounds and healing for those who want more details there. And he'll be talking in a different, from a different perspective. So it's very, very useful. Because when you talk about spiritual things, you have to take different perspectives because any one of them isn't going to be able to capture it all. Now that we have some idea of what we mean by spiritual wounds, let's make up an example of a wounded person and then sort of walk through the process of her healing, of her unfolding that inner space of freedom, so to speak. And although this is a person I'm making up, I've dealt with people that have had every one of these things, so I'm just making a composite here, because obviously I can't directly talk about anything that I work with. So obviously, besides one's original sin, everybody has these wounds because of our different life experiences. But the process of healing is basically the same. So once we get the idea of how it works, what sort of approach to take to woundedness, we can easily apply it to our own circumstances. So we're going to make up a woman. We'll call her Judy. At the age of 16, she gets violated. She winds up pregnant. When her dad finds out, he flips out, and she caves into his pressure and has an abortion. But then complications set in, and as a result, she has to have a hysterectomy. So now she's sterile. So she starts drinking and acting out. But as the years wear on, uh, she finds herself more and more unhappy. She finds herself like what used to be somewhat pleasurable and at least able to deaden the pain seems more and more gross and disgusting to her. She just can't convince herself anymore that the drinking and sleeping around is fun. And she feels more and more empty, more and more used, and just plain miserable. Now obviously, before Judy's inner space of freedom can unfold, so to speak, she's got to heal. She's got to heal from the trauma being violated, from the wound of her dad pressuring her to, to abort his grandchild, from the abortion itself, 
from the fact that with a hysterectomy she can have, have another child, from her disordered drinking, from all her acting out. There's other things we'll touch on later. So Judy is very, very wounded, but she's like, her, her, her name, she's legion. This is, this is the society we're living in. Huh? How can someone, can somebody like Judy even be healed? Absolutely. I've seen people heal from every one of the sort of wounds that Judy has. I've seen men and women that are actually a lot more wounded, a lot more far, farther gone than Judy heal. Some are in the process, some are well on the way, and some have actually made it to the heights of holiness. And I'm using that in the proper sense of the word. I mean, real sanctity. Okay? It's definitely possible for somebody like Judy to be healed and experience a true freedom, a true happiness, experience truly being loved. So how would she set out on this healing journey? The first step in any journey is the most important. She can't be close to the truth. Judy can't get anywhere unless she's open to the truth. So that's the first step. She has to make an act of the will. She'll be open to the truth no matter where that leads her. Now it's important. She may wisely suspect she's not strong enough to embrace the truth about herself in all one glance, but she isn't asked to do that. She doesn't have to do that. She can take it one step at a time, but she has to be committed to facing the truth and over time the whole truth. What is essential? She remains open to the truth no matter where it leads it. It is absolutely impossible to make progress without it. And so often, this is the very reason why people remain stuck in bondage. They're miserable, unhappy conditions. I had a friend, I can talk about this because it's a publicly known thing. But uh, just really briefly, she had uh, a situation like this and had a hysterectomy. And then she became uh, an activist, an abortion activist, pro abortion. It took her 10 years to admit to herself that the only children she would ever have, she had been involved in aborting. She couldn't start the healing for 10 years. But once she admitted that, then she was on the way. She was on the way, okay? But you don't have to admit it all at once. They, they don't just can't or won't. The reason so many people get stuck is they can't or won't admit the truth to themselves. There can't be any real progress. The kind of healing we're talking about is an act of God that requires the cooperation of a man. Because God is truth himself. God will not. And he cannot build on a lie. This is why we must be open to the truth about ourselves if we want to heal. God can't build on a lie. He can't heal a lie. He can't. He's God, but there's things he can't do, and that's a contradiction in terms, is to expect God to prove a lie. So it's absolutely essential for Judy to be dedicated to the truth, no matter how painful and inconvenient may be to her personally. Again, a lot of people bog down right there. They want things to be the way they want them to be and not the way they really are. Now let's consider two possibilities. First, supposing that her situation is far too horrific for her to face initially. So Judy just can't take it. Um, secondly, second situation, although supposing it's very painful, she can face her situation initially. So we're going to start with that she can't even face it. It's much too much to her for her to handle initially. And this is realistic. Because of her damage and woundedness from the violation, compounded by her dad's rejection of her in her hour of greatest need, followed by the trauma of the abortion, the resulting uh, sterilization, it's quite possible that of her own accord, Judy just can't face the truth about herself. She's wounded, she's traumatized. The very person she looked for love and protection, acceptance, violently rejected her and conspired in the murder of his own grandson and ultimately the sterilization of his own daughter. And so all that's too painful for her. And of course, at some level, she'll know that. That's probably the principal source of her wild, rebellious behavior, huh? She has to start somewhere. So let's suppose for this minute here, she's too much for her to face. It really is too horrific. It seems like she'd be stuck since she has to be dedicated to the truth about who she is, and that truth is way too much for her to handle. But with this sort of horrific trauma, she shouldn't necessarily try to call the circumstances to mind. This is not a psychological exercise. It's a spiritual thing. It's not necessary, it might even do more harm than good. So what can she do? What can Judy do if her life or situation is just too painful for her to actually face, or even to think about much? It's actually quite simple. 
She needs to ask Our Lady to bring our Lord into woundedness and pain and heal her and make her free. She has to pray something along these lines. God, I can't handle this, but you can. Give me the grace to admit the truth about myself. Give me the grace to see myself as you see me and to love myself as you love me. God, I can't handle this, but you can. I'm turning it all over to you. Give me the grace to see and admit the truth about myself. Give me the grace to see myself as you see me and to love myself as you love me. And over time, if Judy's faithful to this sort of prayer, God will come into her life, into her woundedness. And the result is she'll heal and get strong enough to be able to start facing more of the reality. She'll get the grace to persevere in this healing journey. So that's the first possibility. The situation is too horrific for her to face it initially. We're about to explain what her next steps would be because now she's actually moved herself with the grace of God to the next thing where it's painful, but she can start admitting the truth. That's the second possibility. Even if the situation was too much for her to handle initially, she's now moved to the point where all it's very painful, she can face the situation initially. So what should she do? She should pick a wound. Let's say the violation. Now, if she wants to be healed, Judy has to make an act of the will that she really wants this to be healed, and she's willing to suffer whatever it takes to be free of this wound, and that's critical. She has to make an act of the will that she actually wants this to be healed. She's willing to suffer whatever it takes to be free of this wound. Now, I've talked elsewhere in detail about this, just parenthetically. This sounds strange, but a lot of people won't want to let go of it because I think this is my pain. I went through it. Nobody else can understand it, etc. Listen to the other conferences about that. But that's one of the reasons she has to make that will. She's willing to be healed. Huh? She wants to be free. She can do whatever it takes. She has to have it in her mind. It's going to hurt. It is going to hurt. It's like resetting a broken bone in your heart. It's going to hurt. But in this case, she's, it's going to hurt. But in healing, the pain is because, because it's being released and coming out. When she got wounded, it was pain going in. And she's had it in there all that time. Now it's pain going out. So that pain, that hurt, that stuff coming out. It's like she's been standing on a manhole cover, and as she, as she starts doing these prayers of healing, that manhole cover gets released, and then this stuff starts flowing out. People will call me up and say, Father, there's something wrong. All this stuff going on. I go, that's actually something right. It shows your prayers are being heard. It's going to hurt. But that hurt was there all that time. Okay? So the most important thing is to make an act of will. She wants this to be healed, and she's willing to suffer whatever it takes to be free of this wound. She has to have it in mind. It's going to hurt. But that pain can be put to good use. Just one small anecdote in that regard before we go on. Uh, Yvonne Beauvais, she was later known as Mother Yvonne Amy of Jesus, was one of the most remarkable women of the last century. She was a victim soul, among other things, was given the mission to suffer for priests and make reparation for those who committed sacrileges against the Most Blessed Sacrament. She's a 24-year-old woman waiting to be accepted in the convent when on August 10, 1925, she was ambushed and kidnapped by three men. They beat her and tortured her, and I can't talk about that really uh, in this venue. One of the men torturing her was actually a depraved priest whom she had previously tried to help by delivering him a warning from our Lord. And then he violated her. She was tossed out blindfolded in a deserted street in a rough part of Paris. She'd been kidnapped, beaten, tortured, violated by a priest and tossed out on an empty street. She's waiting to end her religious life, but now she doesn't know what's going to become of her, her vocation of her life. In her journals, She wrote, quote, Jesus chose the heaviest cross, the most humiliating. I suffered atrociously in all parts of my body, in every fiber of my heart and my soul. But the most beautiful entry is your simple statement that, quote, After this trial, I obtained that same year 
the ransom of 32 souls of priests in danger. Close quote. So that pain didn't go to waste. She paid the price for the souls of 32 priests. And we're almost impossible to convert when we go back. And what became of the reprobate priest of Lyon? He later repented and was converted. She paid the price for that man, that Judas priest. The pain didn't go to waste. Look, when we're talking about healing serious wounds, it's going to hurt. It's doable, though. It doesn't have to go to waste. And if you offer it up, it won't. And you can certainly pray to Mother Yvonne and me at Jesus to help you here. Okay. So Judy identified a wound, the violation. She makes an act of the will. She really wants it to be healed. She's willing to suffer whatever it takes to be free of this wound. She has to have it in her mind that it's going to hurt. And in the healing, it hurts because the pain is being released and going out while it's wounding. The pain was going in. So she's picked up on, she wants to be healed. Now she needs to turn to Our Lady and pray along these lines. Blessed Mother of God, I completely open to thee this wound of violation and everything associated with it and everything that flowed from it. Then she asks Our Lady, I beg thee to wash, cleanse, and purify this wound of thy tears and precious blood of thy son. Then, then she asks Our Lady, I beg thee to bring thy son into this wound to heal it. Then she asked her, I beg thee to fill this spot with charity together with thy son to stay and rule. Okay? Walk back through it. She turns to Our Lady and tells Our Lady, I completely open this wound. And she names the wound. And everything associated with it and everything that flowed from it. Because she wants to open all that up. She doesn't have to remember it. She shouldn't try to remember it. The object isn't to go into the fetal position in her bedroom and not get up. It's to be healed. So she's just making an act of will to open it up and ask Our Lady to come into it. Then she asks Our Lady to cleanse and purify it with her tears and the, and the precious blood of her son. Then she asks Our Lady to bring her son into that wound to heal it. And then she asks Our Lady and her son to fill it with charity and to stay there and rule because they've been closed out of that part of their life. But he's outside of time. He can come into that. Okay? So she opens completely this wound of violation, everything associated with it, and everything flowing from it. She asks the lady to wash, cleanse, and purify it with her tears and the blood of her son. She asks her to bring her son into it, to heal it, and to fill that spot with charity together with her son to stay in Rome. Okay? Another important point to keep in mind when someone's trying to heal from these wounds and seriously pray, asking our Lord to bring our lady to bring our Lord to each and every area to heal. And oftentimes, previously unknown wounds will be revealed in the process. It's very common. It wouldn't be surprising at all if sometime during this process, Judy came to a deep understanding and knowledge of other wounds she'd completely forgotten about. And over time, if Judy is faithful to these kind of prayers, day in and day out, this horrific wound will begin to heal. That inner space of freedom deep within her soul will begin to unfold. How will she know? She'll actually know. One of the easiest ways she'll be able to tell is she'll be able to think about the event, perhaps even be able to discuss it with a close spiritual friend or director, and there won't be any pain. There won't be any emotions associated with before. Before she's just almost fold up. It'll be just something that happened, but the emotional bondage, that pain, the fear, that'll dissipate over time. That's a sign that the spiritual wound is turning into a spiritual scar. There's actually other things that are going to have to happen before she gets that deep healing she desires. That has to do with forgiveness. She'll have a lot of forgiving to do. We've talked about this before in the process of healing. That's absolutely essential. But with the time we have today, we won't be able to review that aspect. Those talks are readily available online. Okay. Besides the, these sort of healing prayers, placing this in a rosary, making frequent confession, and, and, and fervent communions are, one of the most, are some of the most fruitful practices that Judy can use to speed up the process of healing. But another one that's very, very important is the, pro- is, a, is the practice of formal renunciations. In this whole process of healing, Judy's learning to allow God to come into her areas of her life 
that because of the wounds have barriers, so to speak, around them. But healing comes precisely from God coming into those wounded areas and healing them. So another way of looking at healing is it's actually a way of establishing a much deeper relationship with God in the life of a wounded person. And guess what? Except for her. Everybody's wanted to get to the transforming union. That means Judah needs to completely reject anything that hurts her relationship with God, anything that's a barrier between her and God. And the very way Judy can do that is by formal renunciations. Now, the technical $3 word for this kind of renunciation is an adjuration. Okay? Before we explain how to do this, we'll explain what we're trying to do when we're making a formal renunciation. Typically, when there's a wound, there's a disordered attachment. There's an attachment of some sort that actually interferes with the healing process. For example, it's very common for someone who's been a real party animal in his youth to have a sort of perverse pride in his ability to party and drink with the best of them. And that perverse pride uh, would absolutely, it would be a disordered attachment. He's attached to that pride, and that will uh, block his healing. Even if he's confessed it, repented, he hasn't necessarily renounced it, so he still has that in him. So that's a barrier between that wounded man and God. So the whole point of a formal renunciation is to break free of a disordered attachment. So how would uh, Judy make a formal renunciation of one of her disordered attachments? Let's suppose that right now she's working on forgiving her dad. She prays something along these lines. I completely and utterly reject with the full force of my will. Everything that's disordered or displeasing to God, that part always stays the same. And here we go with my thoughts, attitudes, and emotions concerning my dad. I do this, this is why it's called an adoration. Here's the key part. I do this in the holy names of Jesus and Mary, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. She'd repeat this in three times in the the Most Blessed Trinity. We'll walk back through that. Again, I completely and utterly reject with the full force of my will anything and everything that's disordered or displeasing to God in my thoughts, attitudes, or emotions concerning my dad. I do this in the holy names of Jesus and Mary, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. One more time, so you burn it in your mind. I completely and utterly reject the full force of my will. Anything and everything that's displeasing to God in my thoughts, attitudes, or emotions concerning my dad. I do this in the holy name of Jesus and Mary, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, obviously, she has to be serious here. She has to mean what she says. And I'm not talking about feeling it. She has to mean it, though. Or this would most definitely be the sin of taking the name of the Lord in vain in a very serious matter. Because you're calling on the name of the Lord to actually help you make this act of the will. So you don't just randomly say it, you say it because you mean it. Okay. Now, once Judy's honed in on a particular problem, the results are remarkable. They're really remarkable. What this accomplishes, this kind of adjuration, is a breaking away of that disordered attachment. The will releases, as it were, this disordered attachment by the power of the Holy Name. Oftentimes there'll be a, a feeling of release or a sense of uh, freedom when this is done. It varies with individuals. But it's not uncommon that somehow they talk about feeling it in their spirit, although it's not really a feeling, but they actually feel like this burden has been released because they just suddenly detach from something they've been attached to. Another thing that Judy should pray for is a God sent a good spiritual companion, a friend on the same journey, or a good spiritual director. Uh, please don't ask me. My director won't let me take anybody else. <laughs> she must pray uh, for this, though. Because if she's truly serious, she'll get what she needs. She'll get a good spiritual companion or someone else on the same journey or a good director. She'll get what she needs, not necessarily what she wants. And this is super important for people who are trying to heal, to burn into their minds. If Judy's truly serious about healing, she'll get what she needs, not necessarily what she wants. And this is super important to realize in the beginning because when someone is starting on the healing journey, what they want, what they think they need, indeed may be not even remotely close to what they actually need. But in their woundedness, they just can't see that. So Judy won't be able to see that. So Judy should pray to God that she sends her good director, a companion, a spiritual companion, a friend on the same journey. Has to pray for it. This is hugely significant in the healing process. Because in the process of unfolding this inner place of freedom in her heart, she needs to be able to accept and love herself. And part of that, accepting and loving yourself, is being loved in truth and accepted in truth by another. And I emphasize the word in truth. Once again, Father Jacques Philippe, a long quote, but very meaningful. Accepting ourselves is much more difficult than it might seem. Pride, fear of not being loved, the conviction of how little we are worth are all too deeply rooted in us. Think how badly we react to our falls and mistakes and failures, 
how demoralized and upset we become, how guilty they make us feel. Only under the gaze of God can we fully and truly accept ourselves. We need to be looked upon by someone who says, as God did through the prophet Isaiah, you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. Consider a very common experience. A girl who believes she's plain, as curiously enough do many girls, even pretty ones, begins to think that she might not be so frightful after all on the day a young man falls in love with her and looks at her with the tender eyes of someone in love. We urgently need the mediation of another's eyes to love ourselves and accept ourselves. The eyes may be that of a parent, a friend, a spiritual director, but above all they are those of God our Father. The look in his eyes is the purest, truest, tenderest, most loving, and most hope-filled in this world. The greatest gift given those who seek God's face by persevering in prayer may be that one day they will perceive something of this divine look upon themselves. They will feel themselves loved so tenderly that they will receive the grace of accepting themselves in depth. What has just been said has an important consequence. When people cut themselves off from God, they deprive themselves of any real possibility of loving themselves. This is easily seen in the developments of modern culture. When they cut themselves off from God, people end up by losing their sense of human dignity and hating themselves. It is striking, for example, to see how humor in the media is less and less the humor of tenderness and compassion, and instead the humor of derision. Art also is incapable of representing the beauty of the human face. This also works the other way. People who hate themselves cut themselves off from God. Close quote. When Judy sees that she can be loved for who she truly is, that this love is forever and will not leave her. This is a huge freedom. In that regard, I'll tell you a little anecdote, and I don't, won't give any uh, details, but I do have explicit permission to, to say this. As it turned out, a priest got caught in a situation where he had to hear uh, someone's confession face to face while he was uh, sitting at a table. Uh, and now, unless the pr- penitent is laying there in a the hospital bed, uh, that's just not something that this priest does. But he got caught in the situation. The woman made a very good and obviously uh, very painful confession. And after it was done, since they were sitting around the table, they had something to eat together, and they just chatted, talked, joked a little bit. So sometime later, he ran into her, and she told him that having that meal and that little visit after her confession was one of the most... Uh, healing experiences, liberating experiences she had ever experienced in her entire life. And the priest was surprised and said, why? All we did was have some beam choke around a little bit. And she told him in so many words that it was so healing because she really had come clean, really had buried his soul to him, and she was fully expected to be rejected by that priest. She was convinced that in some way he'd push her away. And instead he ate with her and joked around. So somehow in that moment, she experienced a divine touch. She had experienced the love of the Heavenly Father. In that moment, she somehow realized that she could be loved for who she truly was with a heavenly love. A love that will last forever. How many wounded people have practically worn themselves out trying not to be rejected, yet in spite of their efforts, they're always let down. They fall into despair and start thinking they'll never be loved and that they're unlovable. But suddenly, when they finally start experiencing that love of God for who they truly are, then they can start accepting themselves, forgiving, loving themselves, and then they can start going free. There's one more important topic we have to briefly cover. That topic is how to recognize the areas in our lives that are wounded. We'll just touch on this briefly again. I want to recommend Father Ripperger's talks. The question of what are my wounds is a spiritual question. Some wounds are going to be obvious. If we're violently assaulted, childhood, if we had an abortion, etc. But many wounds are not obvious. We need to turn to the Holy Spirit and Our Lady and beg over and over, come Holy Spirit, help me see myself as you see me. I love myself as you love me. Plus, Mother, help me see myself as you see me. I love myself as you love me. Come Holy Spirit, help me see myself as you see me. I love myself as you love me. Blessed Mother, help me see myself as you see me. Love myself as you love me. And over time, less obvious problems will become apparent. In fact, as I already mentioned previously, unknown wounds are very commonly revealed to the person. 
It's really important since there's many ways to be wounded, many different types of wounds. Wounds can come from our families, they can be passed on almost like an inheritance. For example, family pride. It's good to have a healthy pride or love for one's family, but a sort of arrogance in some families can be ingrained into each member, or a spirit of harshness, and so forth and so forth. Souls can be easily wounded by loss of a parent, by being raised in a broken home, a home without love, a home full of violence and words and deeds, or they've been abused physically or emotionally. Wounds can even rise in utero in the womb. If the mother rejected the pregnancy or seriously considered aborting the child, or even if she experienced a serious sickness or trauma, some kind of traumatic sorrow, as amazing as it sounds, that baby can experience rejection and may need healing from that. In both these cases, the inherited wound and the wound in utero, the family needs to be forgiven from the heart. And this will become obvious in prayer because you're not going to remember it. It's going to be something that will just appear in prayer that you need to pray about something that happened when you're very, very small. Okay? There's a lot more to be said that's sufficient to get everybody on the right path. Okay. A few more observations before we close. What I'm going to say right now might not apply to every soul that does this. I suspect it does. I just want to observe over the past decade or so that in the experience of the wounded souls I've worked with that are faithful to these kind of prayers, at a certain point in time, there's suddenly a major, for that person, miraculous inner healing. They're lifted by divine grace, as it were, to a plateau. They're given this deep inner peace and a major healing. For the most part, this is not a complete healing. They're given a deep healing, the ones I've worked with, and a deep peace, but then there's areas to work on, areas with which they're still needed by the lady to bring in the Lord's grace and life. And I think that's to keep courage and to keep walking on that path, keep up that prayer life, to deepen that relationship with Christ our Lord and Mother. That's my opinion of why this happens like that. Because they get such an encouragement because they can see, wow, you know, look how I am compared to how I was yesterday, huh? But here's a sad point. This is my other point. As we've already pointed out, we have to make an act of the will. We really want to be healed. We're willing to suffer whatever it takes to be healed. I have had wounded souls that made great progress, actually truly miraculous progress, miracles of grace. They've been given deep inner peace, but a major healing. But as usual, they've been left with areas to work on. I've had souls in spite of all those graces and gifts showered down and they've chosen to turn back. God's given us free will. He respects that. He'll never take it away. He won't force us to be healed. He won't force us to forgive others. He won't force us to be saved. He won't force us to spend eternity with Him in heaven. Final point. If anyone has these kind of wounds and wants to discuss them with a priest, it's essential, at least initially, it takes place in confession under the seal. And be careful about the priest. You don't want to go and get yourself wounded more. That's just a reality. When it comes to that, I'm just as much a Catholic as everybody else. I have to go to confession and all that. I know what it is. I'm not, you know, at that point, yeah, I'm a priest, but I have to go to, I know what it's like. Be careful. Okay? You want to keep it in the confessional because that way the sacramental facts, the most precious blood can pour over the wounds and they keep it under the seal because that's safe and it's anonymous. Over time, if there's a need, the wounded soul might discuss the situation in an external form, but if and only if the priest, the priest is balanced and completely trustworthy, never just start discussing these things with a priest outside the confessional. I mean, 12 alarms, big flashing lights, okay, I mean it. All right, let's close. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody needs to be loved.